Well, good morning, John Safari. It's so great to be with you as it is every single Sunday. I want to welcome those of you here on campus. Also welcome everyone who is engaged online, and we're so grateful for you wherever it is that you are worshiping with us from. You know, it's been an incredible service already, and you can just sense God's presence here, and we need that presence simply because we live in just trying days, I mean, right? I mean, you look, you look at the news today, and there's just so much to be praying for, so much that's heavy on our hearts. We want to be praying for certainly those who live in the New Orleans area, just that whole um, part of our country that's about to embrace this huge storm this afternoon, certainly praying for the Afghanistan situation and all those lives that were tragically lost, including U.S. service men, soldiers. Um, certainly COVID is still with us, whether we want it to be or not. Um, these, are just, these are just difficult days. And you know, what I, what I see is a world that is looking for and longing for hope, and that hope is only found in Jesus. Amen? And so we need to be beacons of that light, beacons of, of that hope. I'm so grateful for you as a church because of your generosity. Uh, we were able to contribute in some ways financially to some of these needs. In fact, this week we cut a $50,000 check to send relief to help with Haiti uh, rescue and, and relief efforts. And, well, hold on, hold on, you chill out. Uh, and we also cut another $50,000 check to World Relief to help with those in Afghanistan. So we can thank the Lord for that. Amen. And, and we just need to come back to the things where we find hope, which is in Jesus, and the gathering of the saints, and, and what we do Sunday and all throughout the week. And it's why tonight is so important, our, our night of worship. It's not a concert, it's not a performance. It, it's, it's yet another chance to worship away the worry and to be reminded where our hope is. I hope you're gonna be here tonight. I, I can't wait for tonight. I need tonight just to worship with our church family. I, I wanna lead you to some very strategic prayer times tonight. It's not gonna be live streamed, so you gotta be here, but we can't wait to see what God does tonight at seven. Today we're wrapping up the series All In. We've asked you this question, actually two, are you all in with Jesus? Are you all in with Johnson Ferry? And it's part of a larger initiative that we've called Relaunch, which is more than just, hey, the fall is here, and so we need to get people back on campus. No, Relaunch is really about DNA. It's about who we are longing and aiming to be as the people of God. So the, the core parts of who we are, are we're trying to accentuate and give new language to this fall. And we've, we've said them all four weeks, so hopefully by now you have them memorized. We're gonna keep saying these throughout the whole year, but what are our four strategic words that we have learned in this series? In fact, I don't have to say them because you know them, so what are they? are? Connect, multiply, yeah, it's pretty good. Connect, equip, multiply, and repeat. So we talked two weeks about being connected to God and one another in the church. We talked being, about being equipped to serve and how we can use our gifts, our talents, our abilities to serve the body of Christ, to serve the kingdom. Today, we want to talk about multiplying and what it looks like to multiply. Could you just take your mind to a place? Imagine, imagine that it's about 60, 70 AD. You were part of a secret church, an underground church in the city of Rome. And you're gathered weekly as you do, trying not to attach too much attention to yourselves to come together under the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of bread and of prayer. And you are in this little back corner of a house worshiping Jesus with this fledgling group. I guess we need to call it a church. And you're sitting there worshiping and you, you look out the window down the street and you see signs of Roman dominance everywhere. Caesar's picture is everywhere. His face is on the coinage. As you walk to work, as you walk to the market, you see Roman soldiers reminding you that you better stay in line or else. And Romans start talking about you, you, you Christians. After all, you Christians, you it's reported that you, you eat flesh, that you drink people's blood. It's reported that there's some odd sexual relationships amongst you. you. You call each other brothers and sisters when you're not even related to one another. 
And the greatest crime that you have committed as a Christian against Rome is that you reject the gods who have given Rome their favor. Nero, the emperor, would blame you. We know that a great fire was set in Rome in 64 AD, and who else to blame but the Christians? So we'll light them on fire, which is what he did. He would literally light the bodies of Christians on fire, stick them on a pole, and hang them along the entrance to Rome so people would know what happens when you defy Caesar. And there you are in this little underground church. Everyone's singing, but you're thinking to yourself, is this for real? I mean, Jesus Christ died on a cross, rose from the grave, ascended to heaven, but that was 30 years ago. He said he was gonna change everything, and I... It seems like there's so little impact, so, so little of the radical changes that I thought were coming. He's the Messiah after all. Isn't he gonna fix everything all at once? God, what do I do with, with this sense of despair? What do I do when I look and I see evil and injustice happening everywhere? What, what do I do with this kind of cognitive dissonance of God, you're in charge, and yet it seems like the world is spinning out of control? And you look at this church and you wonder, is this, is this working? And then you're haunted with perhaps the deepest question of all, is it worth it? The song ends and your pastor stands up. He doesn't yet have a Bible in the way we would talk about today, but he says, today I wanna to talk to you about some of the parables of Jesus. And all of a sudden God has a word for you. It's found in Matthew 13. It's a little parable. Matthew 13, verse 31. And in this little parable, there's great strength, there's great hope. And so you, underground church, why don't you stand up and let's hear what Jesus has to say. He presented another parable to them saying, the kingdom of heaven It's like a mustard seed, which a person took and sowed in his field. And this is smaller than all the other seeds. But when it is fully grown, it is larger than the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the sky come and nest in its branches. Father, once again, as we wrestle with our own questions, related to the kingdom of God, would you speak to us through this parable? And we'll pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can have a seat. So all month long, we've used the same pattern. We've looked at the parables of Jesus, and then we've tried to take a little time at the end to think, how does this apply to us as the people of Johnson Ferry, not just Christians generally everywhere, but specifically to this body, this house, what does it look like for us to be the people of God? Jesus told a parable to his disciples that the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, he uses those phrases interchangeably, is like a mustard seed. Now the kingdom of heaven is where God's rule, his his reign is. And sometimes Jesus means that in a way to talk about his invisible reign, meaning God's control over all things and, and his people of all times and places. And sometimes Jesus means it referring to his visible reign. We might even equate that to the church where God is at work in this church age, his kingdom. And he says, despite what it feels like at time and despite even what you see on your phones and on the TV, The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed, a mustard seed. Now, most of us have probably never planted mustard, but there in Israel, mustard seeds, especially in his day, were fairly common. They're tiny little seeds. I mean, really tiny. You could put dozens and dozens on your fingertip, and if just a little bit of wind came, they would would blow. And Jesus says it's the smallest of all the seeds. Now, before you think, well, no, technically there are seeds smaller than that, Jesus is simply making the point that this is a seed that everyone knew, that everyone saw, and they saw it cultivated all over the place. And it came from this tiny, tiny little seed. 
And yet, when it went, and if someone were to put it in the ground and cultivate it, it would grow up to be a tree. Not, not a big cedar tree or a pine tree, but, but a tree. It's amazing something so small could produce a tree of its size. And Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God. Now, if Jesus had been from the South, which is maybe something that you would more relate to, he might have said this. The kingdom of God is like kudzu. It's like kudzu. Do you know what kudzu is? Uh, I got a picture here. I bet you've seen it. You can see all up and down Johnson Ferry Road, all over kinds of neighborhoods. I actually took this from one of your yards this week and uh, <laughs> used it this morning. Yeah, kudzu, you know this. this. Actually, this was introduced, I think, in 1847 at a fair by the Japanese. And somewhere in the 1930s and 40s, someone got the brilliant idea that this would make wonderful top cover for irrigation, you know, or erosion, and we planted like a million acres of this in the Southeast uh, United States of America, and we are still paying the price today. But in the same way, kudzu just seems to take over and, and just grows everywhere, whether you want it to or not, Jesus is saying something about the kingdom of God, how it grows and how it expands, even when you can't see it, even when you don't feel it. And he's talking about the nature of the kingdom of God, that it is like a mustard seed, but it has implications for us as citizens in his kingdom. What is that implication? Well, it's primarily this, that we were made to multiply. We were made to multiply. If, I, if you were a follower of Jesus, you were made to multiply. Now you get this parable, it's fairly easy to understand. But what does this have to do with the kingdom? What's it have to do with the church? And how does this give me confidence? And how does it give me the marching orders for how Jesus wants me to live? Well, there are several facets about this kingdom that are seen even in this little parable, this, this little earthly story with a great heavenly meaning. And we see at least a couple things about the kingdom of God. Number one, the kingdom of God is unimpressive. It's unimpressive. Now, of course, you would say, no, no, the kingdom of God is very impressive. And I would agree, I would agree with you theologically in what I know about the kingdom of God. But looking at it, at times, it feels unimpressive. A mustard seed, a tiny little tiny seed is, is fairly unimpressive until it grows. If we're being honest, Jesus was fairly unimpressive. Born in Bethlehem, chose Nazareth as his hometown, you know what Andrew said, one of those disciples? You know, can any good thing come from Nazareth? Grew up the son of a carpenter, maybe more precisely, a, one who worked with stone, a stonemason. Regardless, Jesus wasn't all that to look at. And while we appreciate the significance of what he accomplished on the cross, from an outsider looking in, he was just one more criminal that died a horrific death on a cross, like a ton of criminals did, unimpressive. Not only was he unimpressive, but his method for changing the world, if we're just quite honest, was unimpressive. Think for a second, if you were Jesus' brand consultant, you know, how do, how do we get this message out? You're, you're marketing Jesus. You got three years of public ministry. What are you gonna do? You're thinking, we gotta go big, Jesus. We need stadiums, thousands of people, lights, smoke. I mean, we, we, gotta, go, we gotta go big, Jesus. And Jesus spends three years spending most of his time with 12 men, who, by the way, were pretty unimpressive. 12 men, spent most of his time investing in those 12 men. Unimpressive, and yet you wonder, did it work? And I would say, look around. <laughs> look around. I mean, we're here because of the work of the Holy Spirit, but we are also here today worshiping Jesus because Jesus invested his life in 12 men who changed the world by investing in others. That's the disciple-making principle. To reach many, invest in a few. But from the outside looking in, especially when it seems like the world is going to hell, the kingdom can seem fairly unimpressive. Which is why a second lesson we know about the kingdom of God is that it is unstoppable. <laughs> it is unstoppable, like a mustard seed that will grow into a tree, like kudzu that takes over your neighborhood. <laughs> the kingdom of God is unstoppable. 
Now, Jesus is saying the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. And imagine all that the disciples would have seen in their lifetime. And imagine now, 2,000 years later, what we know, that the kingdom of God, he says, is unstoppable. It will grow. It will expand. It will accomplish its purposes. And the kingdoms of the earth come and go, but the kingdom of God is forever. The kingdoms of this earth come and they go. The Egyptian kingdom, it came and it went. The Assyrian kingdom came and it went. The Babylonian kingdom came and it went. The Persian kingdom came and it went. The Roman kingdom came and it went. The the Mongol kingdom came and it went. On and on and on we could go. Even America, I like this kingdom. I want this kingdom to survive. But let's be honest, based on the precedent of history, this kingdom too will come and it will go. But the kingdom of God is forever. It is forever, and it is unstoppable. You look at the New Testament, how much persecution happened in in little individual ways, but what we often miss is that though we've lived a fairly cozy life here in this great country, imperfect as it is, the last 100 years has seen more Christian persecution than any before. And we've all thought the last week or two about so many of these new believers in Afghanistan who have come to Christ and whose names are on a list and who know, who know that in a matter of days might be meeting Jesus face to face. And yet even in the midst of that, the kingdom of God is unstoppable. It's unimpressive, it's unstoppable, but number three, it is ultimate. It is ultimate, meaning that that we know the end. Jesus says something about a tree. He says, this mustard seed grows, it's in the ground, it grows, it become a tree. And then he throws this interesting comment so that that the birds might come and make a nest in it. Now, Jesus isn't there just making up something as he sees a bird fly around. Jesus here is building upon what the Bible says about trees. The Bible says a lot about trees. Think about some of the famous trees in the Bible. There in the beginning of the Bible, Genesis chapter 2, God has Adam and Eve in the garden, and they're given tons of trees filled with fruit and everything they need, and he wants to provide for them and be in intimate relationship with them. And of course, he says, there's one tree, the tree of life, I don't want you to touch, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Do not touch that tree. Do not eat from that tree, rather. And what do they do? The same thing that we would do. And... They sin. Now, sin, yes, is breaking God's law, but at its core, sin is trusting in yourself instead of trusting in God. And instead of trusting God that if he says it, it's good enough, they had to test it out for themselves. And sin came into the world, and they were banished from that garden and from that tree. We go throughout the Bible. Uh, Daniel 4, King Nebuchadnezzar a great Babylonian king, and he has this dream. And what's the dream? It's this dream of a tree, this massive tree that provides shelter and shade and strength for his people, and God would bring that tree down. Psalm 104 talks about this great tree. But Jesus here in this parable is most likely relying on two different Old Testament passages, one in Isaiah, one in Ezekiel. And Jesus would have said this, Isaiah 27, in days to come, Jacob will take root, Israel will bud, and blossoms will fill all the world with fruit, meaning that there's this great tree coming from Israel that will provide for the whole world. And then in Ezekiel, on the mountain heights of Israel, I will plant it. It will produce branches and bear fruit and become a splendid cedar. Birds of every kind will nest in it. They will find shelter in the shade of its branches. Jesus here is alluding to the fact that one day there will be a tree from Israel that will give its branches to the whole world, Jew and Gentile, finding shade under that tree. And I can't help but to think about Revelation chapter 22. It talks about the new heaven 
and the new earth and the new Jerusalem. And, and you may know this, but it says that from the throne in that great city, there is this river of life that goes through the middle of, of the city. And do you know what is on each side of that river? The tree of life, which the Bible says provides fruit every single month. Why? For the healing of the nations. This kingdom that seems so unimpressive will one day become the kingdom that will provide the healing for the nations. Isn't that good? So the question is, until that ultimate kingdom comes, what are we supposed to do? Well, we were made to multiply. The kingdom multiplies. We, as the followers of Jesus, were made to multiply and to be a part of that expanding kingdom. All month long, I've tried to provide just practical ways that we could think about this. Today, I want to do the same. I want to touch on a few global ways, highlight just a few thoughts as it relates to our church expanding, and then I want to camp out on what you can do this week personally to multiply. So let's talk about it globally. We're a church that takes serious the Great Commission, which literally means to go and disciple the nations. So first of all, I want to think about this. How should Johnson Ferry multiply? Number one, we multiply globally through global sending. Through global sending. Brian Hansen, who does such a great job leading our global team here, our missions team here, gave me just a few, just kind of introductory practical ways to think about global sending. Here are a few. I'm sure there are many more if you contact him. Uh, you can join a weekly prayer meeting on Zoom, Wednesdays at 7 a.m., just jump on there, and it's a great reminder to pray for unreached peoples, to pray for the nations, to pray for our church as it relates to the Great Commission. Number two, you can give to the move offering. This year, you have just crushed the move offering. Our goal was $1.2 million, and I think today you've already given over $1.5 million to the move offering, which is incredible, and that helps to give above and beyond to the Great Commission. Uh, we have some of the heroes of the world. You know, our, our mission partners uh, who often will come back to the States for a little season of just kind of rejuvenation. And you can provide housing, even a vehicle for them while they are here. And of course, our, our hopeful goal is that you would go overseas on a team. Maybe that's short term, but we're praying that more of you would go mid and long term, meaning that maybe a year from now, some of you are selling your house, moving to another country where there are unreached peoples and finding strategic ways to share the gospel there. So if we're gonna multiply, we have to start globally. Global multiplication. All right, number two, how about as a church? Let's think about that. Multiply locally through local church multiplication. Now here, I just wanna plant a few seeds, no pun intended, for what the future of Johnson Ferry might look like. Regardless of what that is, it probably means that we need to take seriously things like church planting, we need to pray about opportunities to expand into multiple campuses beyond just 955 Johnson Ferry Road to reach some very strategic parts of the city of Atlanta with the gospel. But even at an even smaller level, your connect groups, you need to always think about multiplying. How are you sending out leaders, sending out new groups? Maybe they meet on Sundays, maybe they meet during the week. Beyond that, we wanna think about replicating discipleship groups that are high on relationship, high on accountability, high on partnering in the gospel. Maybe that's three, four, five, six of you that meet regularly, spurring one another on to be disciples of Jesus. That's how we have to think, connecting, equipping, multiplying, even at the smallest of levels, which gets us to the personal, something we can all do as followers of Jesus, and that is evangelism, and disciple making, evangelism and disciple making. Now, there are many times where I get up here and I say, hey, we need to share the gospel with people. We need to share Jesus with people. And a lot of you go, amen, we need to do that. And really nothing ever happens. And there's a lot of factors in there. Sometimes it's a fear factor, but sometimes it's just 
a knowledge factor. Like you, you don't exactly know how to do that. And we think sometimes that's more caught than taught. So I thought we would do a little role playing today uh, to give you maybe an example of how to have a gospel conversation. And to do that, I've asked uh, one of our great team members here, Johnson Ferry, Brian Fox, who works on our global team to come and help me. So you guys welcome Brian Fox out here. All right, so this is where I'm gonna need you to kind of suspend your belief for a second, all right? So Brian and I will just say our neighbors, and um, let's pretend I'm not a pastor, okay. all right? So it's the weeknight, and it, tomorrow's trash day. We'll say that. All right. all right, so we're rolling out our trash cans to the street. You know how that is, and you kind of meet up and um, in our sport coats and that kind of thing, and we're, <laughs> we are, uh, we're coming down to the street, and then let's say that you're a follower of Jesus, and I'm not. So let's think about just kind of what a conversation might look like. So, all right. You ready? Ready. Scene. Okay. All right. So, okay. Hey, Clay. How's hey, it Brian? going, man? I'm good. I'm good. How you doing, man? I'm doing well. How are Terika and the girls? Oh, they're good. They're good. I mean, it's, it's a crazy time of year. School and yeah. schedules and sports and all that. It's, uh, yeah, it is really busy. But, yeah, I hear you, you know, I guess everyone has that. Yep. How's uh, work going for you? It's pretty good. There's... Sin and death everywhere. It's uh, good. I'm just kidding. <laughs> sorry. No. Sorry. Your, your fake job. Oh, fake job. Fake, job. fake job. Fake job. Yes, sorry. Thank you. Fake job. <laughs> uh, fake job. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's been crazy, honestly. I mean, it, it, I mean they're talking layoffs. So I, I don't know. I'm just, I don't know what to think about all that. It's, it's, it's just been a crazy year. Yeah. Sounds like it's been a huge burden on your back then. Yeah. 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 Big time. I gotta run in the girls. My girls are waiting for me to gotcha. tuck them in. Yeah, man. But it's good hey, to see before you. I go, yeah. do you mind if I just uh, pray about that for you? That'd be okay? Sure. Like, as in right here now? Sure. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm, yeah. Maybe. Yeah, that'd be, yeah. We'll embrace the awkward. How's okay, that? yeah. That, okay. Yeah, that'd be great. All right, let me do that real quick. Okay, thanks, man. All right. Heavenly Father, just thank you for Clay. I pray for the burdens he carries at work, that you would help him and bless him and use that to draw him to yourself. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks, man. Yeah. I appreciate that, thanks. Yeah. Hey, you know what? There was a time in my life when I was pretty empty and miserable that I found Jesus, turned to follow, chose to follow him, and now I have real peace and contentment in my life. I hmm. uh, hope you've seen that as a neighbor, but do you have a story like that? Like about Jesus? Sure. I mean, not really. I mean, I've heard of Jesus, but I, w I mean, I wouldn't say I have a story yeah. like that. No. Well, I'm a little bit troubled since you're my senior pastor. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. All right. You can back in character. All right, sorry. Touche. Touche. Scene. All right. So, uh, you know, thank, I appreciate your honesty. Um, yeah. Let me show you something that I, I taught my girls before. It's just sure. little scribbles that really, huh. honestly, have just changed my life. Um, okay. All right, so here you go. This little circle with the squiggly line, that's, that's our world, you know, and the squiggly yeah. line represents we are in brokenness. And it's, you know, I don't have to argue with you about the brokenness around us with COVID, Afghanistan, Haiti, Political, ethnic strife, it's, we're in a mess, yeah. you know. Uh, but that heart represents that God didn't create it to be that way. He created us because he loves us, and there wasn't brokenness when he created us in the world. But from the very beginning, we have all run away from God, gone our own way. That's what the Bible calls sin. And that running away from God is what has landed us here in our brokenness, where you know, there's so many things that we try to do, all people try to do, to try to kind of fill that void in our life. You know, so these little squiggly arrows represent maybe success, you know, relationship, um, anything, even addictive behavior, just trying to fix the brokenness in our lives. Mm -hmm. But like a rubber band, you stretch it too far, it bounces you right back, and there you are, stuck in your brokenness. But that's why God sent his son, Jesus, he came to this earth, lived a perfect, sinless life, and then he sacrificed his life on a cross, dying for our sins, so that he could pay the penalty for our sins and our brokenness. 
And then he rose from the dead th three days later, conquering sin and death itself. Hmm. You know, but Clay, as you look at that, it's not enough just to like know it in your head. We're called to do something about it. And that doing something about it is to turn from our brokenness, our sin, and to trust in Jesus. That, that little man on his knees surrendering to God, essentially making him the king of your life, making him the boss of your life. Mm. And the Bible says when we do that, we'll be like a new creation, renewed mm. with a hope of heaven and eternal life and being brought into God's design the way we were meant to be. Mm. So as you look at that, well, what do you think about that? Well, yeah, I mean, I've never, I mean, I've heard about Jesus, you know. Yeah. I mean, but I, I wouldn't consider myself like a real religious person, but I've, yeah. I've never seen it put that way. That's a little different. Sure. Well, I mean, where do you see yourself in that, in that diagram? <laughs> like on what side? Yeah, anywhere. I mean, if I'm just being honest, yeah. I mean, I'm probably here on the right. Like, I'm, my, my world looks a lot like the squiggly lines, man. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's kind of like my life. Yeah, no, I appreciate your honesty. Uh, well, where would you want to be? Well, I mean, the new. I mean, if you're saying there's, yeah. I can be different, that's, that's, that's what I want. Yeah, sure. Is there anything to just kind of preventing you from turning from your brokenness, trusting in Jesus, making him the boss of your life? Like right now? I mean, you're the one who's been complaining about your work, so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah I guess I asked for this, right? Yeah, yeah that's yeah. right. <laughs> I don't know, man. I mean, Brian, I just, I mean, I, like I said, I'm not like a real religious person. I've just, I've never, I just, maybe I should think about it. I don't yeah. know. No, it's cool. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Well, you know, next time we bump into each other at the curb, I'll share <laughs> another story. There's some great <laughs> stories in the Bible of Jesus and the work he did. I'd love to share more about that with you sometime. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing, I man. I appreciate your appreciate openness. It means yeah, a lot. Yeah. All thanks, right, man. It's good to see you. All right. You too. All right, bye. All right. You guys thank Brian Fox right there. Go. All right. So a couple things, and then I want to show you a cool video. A um, couple things. One is that the best way to do this regularly is to be praying for it. There's a, there's a prayer that we use a lot around here. We call it the Bob prayer. You've probably heard this before, but it's worth mentioning again. And Bob stands for burden, opportunity, and boldness. So here's what that looks like. God, what if you pray this every day? God, give me a burden for the lost, an opportunity to have a gospel conversation, and a boldness to speak up. A burden, opportunity this week, and a boldness. Now, in real life, obviously a conversation would last longer than that. We'd probably get more personal than we did, you know, through a role-playing exercise. I might have more questions or objections because that's, that's just real life. But we want to help you to know what do you say when you have that kind of a conversation. So actually there's a couple opportunities. You can go on, online. Our website has some great resources uh, under our global page, I believe. You have it right there where you can get to gospel conversations and you can find out just some more tips and tricks and techniques, that kind of thing to help you share the gospel. Also, on September the 1st, uh, from 6 to 8, we're just going to do a one-time kind of live training. So if you'd like to get more in-depth about, hey, so let's say that I had said, I want to become a Christian. I want to give my life to Christ. What would you, what would you do then? And we're going to talk about that. So be there, uh, one-time deal, September the 1st, 6 to 8. But here's my challenge to you, all right? We're wrapping up this all-in series. Tonight's going to be incredible with a night of worship. But I want you to think about three Sundays from now, September the 19th. It's a baptism day, which just means that we're saying anyone who needs to be baptized, we're gonna baptize that day. I bet there's some people here right now, you need to be baptized on the 19th. But here's my challenge. I wanna challenge every one of you who are a follower of Jesus, between now and the 19th, that's three weeks, now and the 19th, to have one gospel conversation with someone in your life who needs to hear about Jesus. One gospel conversation with someone in your life who needs to hear about Jesus between now and the 19th. And who knows, who knows what God will do and how awesome would it be if you got to lead them to Christ and then we got to see them baptized on the 19th. How amazing would that be? So we're wrapping up this series all in. 
We're connecting, we're equipping, we're multiplying. Hopefully we're repeating. Why? So that we can see lives change by Jesus. You know, a few weeks ago, we witnessed life change through baptism. We wanna celebrate that today to be reminded of the power of the gospel. And if you, maybe you're watching that role-playing exercise, see, honestly, I'm, I'm like you were in that, in that little deal, Clay. I, I've never given my life to Jesus. Make today the day that you turn from your sin, you turn to Christ, you trust him for salvation. Let's celebrate life change today. Let's watch this.